Good evening, everyone. <sighs> Good evening. I am getting used to uh, things here at the Institute and here in Paris where we tend to start on time. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to follow that particular historical model. Um, my name is Tina Camp. And on behalf of the Practicing Refusal Collective and the Sojourner Project Organizing Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first of two evening conversations. In addition to being uh, one of the conveners of the collective, I also have the great privilege of being an Abigail Cohen Fellow and one of 14 fellows in residence here in the inaugural year of the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination which is graciously and generously hosting this convening. I need to thank, to begin with, a group of people who um, really from the Institute have made this possible. Without them, we wouldn't be here. They are Eve Grinstead, um, Grant Rosenberg, um, Marie Dorjani, and our faculty director, Susan Boynton, for their patience and their help and their support organizing the events today and tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I also have to apologize because I'm getting that cold that everybody here is getting, you know, because it turned fast, really cold, really fast. So I apologize for that too, but it does make me sound sexy and I like that. <laughs> Um, I also have to thank Lauren Wolf and Joelle Thibault um, from the Columbia Glo Global Centers for their support in publicizing the events here in Paris. And in addition to the center, I also need to acknowledge our co-sponsors who are listed there. Um, the Barnard Center for Research on Women, the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and the Office of International Programs for the financial support that's made our program possible. <coughs> so please join me first of all in, actually no, um, I also need to have a special thanks as well to Kayama Glover, S uh, Mabula Sumaharo, and Francoise Vergès, who are our together, create our, our Paris organizing committee, and together they, these, these group of people really made this happen. So please, please help me to recognize all the folks who made this possible. So in so many ways, this convening is about a dream and what it means to dream and to imagine something into being. It is about the power of the imagination and what kinds of imaginative power black communities must practice in order to get free. The Practicing Refusal Collective was formed four years ago as, um, as just this kind of imaginative practice. It is an idea dreamed up by myself and my partner in numerous schemes and academic conspiracies, Saidia Hartman, when we decided to try and bring together a group of individuals whose work inspired us to try and think together about black futurity. We came together out of a sense of urgency and in response to the unbearably and increasingly more frequent attacks on black people in our own communities and in diaspora. We came together through our desire to address the spiraling incidents of anti-black violence we were confronting in the US and in the transnational black communities to which each of us are intimately connected in North America, in South America, the Caribbean, Europe, and in Africa. And we came together with a feminist commitment to refuse the precarious state in which so many black communities find themselves, and the ways in which state regimes across the globe are treating black populations as disposable and expendable black bodies, a state of duress that we label as black fungibility. The Sojourner Project is our attempt to broaden this conversation and to create a dialogue with others who feel the same sense of urgency and share a similar commitment to refusing to accept black precarity and anti-black violence as inevitable. 
The practice of refusal referenced in the title of our collective names our rejection of the current status quo as livable. It is a refusal to recognize a social order that renders you fundamentally illegible and unintelligible. It is a refusal to embrace the terms of diminished subjecthood with which we are presented and to embrace instead the radical possibility of living otherwise. The practice of refusal we cite in the title of our collective names our striving to create possibility in the face of ongoing onslaughts of anti-black violence and negation. This evening, we hope to begin a dialogue that allows us to dream and imagine a different kind of black futurity into being. We'll start off with a conversation on how black artists are visualizing the practice of refusal that inspires us to imagine a radically different kind of black futurity. And we'll follow that with a panel discussion among our speakers that will extend this conversation in what we hope will be generative and provocative directions. But we're going to begin um, by sharing a work that we believe provokes this kind of reflection. It is a film entitled, Love is the Message, The Message is Death. And it is a film by one of the members of our collective, Arthur Jaffa. We are delighted to have him here with us this evening, and we are grateful that he has made the video available to us. After the screening, and after we all silence our phones, <laughs> <laughs> let's take the time to silence our phones. Um, after the screening, I'll be joined up here on the, on the stage um, with two other members of our collective for a discussion um, about uh, black artists visualizing a practice of refusal and black futurity. I'll be joined by Assistant Professor of Film and Media and African American Studies at Yale, um, uh, Rizvana Bradley, and Tavi Nyo Tavia Nyuango, Cultural Critic and Professor of African American Studies, American Studies, and Theater Studies at Yale. First of all, thank you, Tina, and everyone um, who are on the Paris Organizing Committee for putting this all together and for bringing us all here. Um, I want to offer some remarks this evening that'll focus on um, that will focus on a different artist. Um, but I also want to think about in our um, panel um, later how Arthur Jaffa's work can be considered a constellation of the poetical image um, and expansive of a larger black poetical imagination as Denise De Silva has theorized it. I'm really glad that we can all gather uh, here for the Sojourner Project because this gives me an opportunity to think simultaneously with two works Christina Sharp's important work um, in the wake on blackness and being, and to engage Denise's, uh, Denise De Silva's thinking. Specifically, I've been struck in my teaching of In the Wake uh, by the particular chapter on the ship. When I teach this chapter, I am often brought back to the particular relational problem of the migrant or refugee. Of course, these two figures are not the same. Uh, the, of the particular relational problem of the migrant or the refugee to the sea and to the shores of Europe. Sharp's thinking, that is, Sharp's thinking has attuned me to the critical relationship between the migrant and the ship. What I want to propose today in my remarks apropos the work of these two thinkers is that we consider how the one who voyages or has no choice but to journey out to sea endures a forced oceanic migration that engenders a new relationship to humanity. The flow of the contemporary news cycle has recently been less concentrated on the makeshift refugee boats always appearing over capacity carrying rejected and deported refugees, presumably destined for death as they sail from Syria, Libya, Egypt, Greece, and Turkey. And yet beyond these spectacularized images, it is the Europeans' encounter that is inevitably contoured and will forever be shaped by a metamorphosis or transformation aided by the traces of bodies exchanged or lost at sea. 
I want to think about how the European experience has been and will forever be defined by the history of such crossings and by the fungible bodies of those who have crossed the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. This brings to mind the Scottish Guyanese artist Hugh Locke's homage to boats in his show Wine Dark Sea, which was on view at the Edward Tyler Nahum Fine Art Gallery in New York in 2014. I want to think about the way Locke's suspended boats bear the imaginative weight of overlapping histories of migrations and ask us to recall the project of poetical thinking initiated by Denise de Silva which insists that the history of Atlantic slavery's particularly brutal and exceptional event does not belong to a distant and, con and concluded past, but is indeed a fundamental and paradigmatic event in the historical formation of our own present and its dominant cultural logic. Furthermore, the moment of hyper-financial development of capitalism that we associate with the late 20th century finds its material and epistemological prerequisite in the 18th century circumatlantic cycle of capital accumulation centered on the slave trade. These are points that I would like to underscore in making reference back to Denise de Silva on poetical thinking which has critical implications for how we begin to think about aesthetic interventions in the present, particularly aesthetic interventions that point to the crucial intersection of poetics, politics, and ethics in a transnational frame. Wine Dark Sea, the title of which Locke draws from the Homeric description of the Aegean, presents ships, gold filigreed galleons, boats, canoes, and sailboats suspended from the gallery ceiling. Locke's work offers itself as a dedication of sorts to refugees from Syria and Iraq, but also blends together references to the Caribbean and Mediterranean seas. Locke's installation, which consists of a selection of up to 34 boats, either hanging on or on stands, uh, range from 23 to 183 centimeters in length, references the Wine Dark Sea as a description of the Mediterranean used by Homer throughout the Odyssey. The phrase is repeated by Derek Walcott in his epic poem, Omeros, set mainly in the Caribbean and references characters from the Iliad. In the remaining time, I will reference Denise de Silva's 2016 essay titled Fractal Thinking and my published response to it. A few things need to be critically deconstructed. The first, de Silva tells us, is the linear thinking that can command no thought outside of a certain Western European critical philosophical trajectory, which is to say, enlightenment or modernity, or the philosophy of history. As an alternative to the linear thinking of philosophers like Slavoj Žižek and Alain Badiou, who both have addressed the so-called migration crisis, De Silva proposes a form of non-linear thinking that animates and drives what she refers to as her expansive poetical project. She writes, quote, when poetical thinking contemplates the present situation in Europe, it does not imit, imagine unprecedented crisis, but rather business as usual for global capital. In other words, the so-called refugee crisis is not without example, but sustains an accumulated history. De Silva's work points to a specific philosophical aporia, an insoluble contradiction within the thinking of contemporary European philosophy. The violent mechanisms of sovereignty, enclosure, and domination that characterize the age of slavery, which in fact enabled the Enlightenment project of emancipation, as well as the spread of capitalism in its current global form, are the very history to which global capital now finds itself irrevocably sutured. De Silva is pointing to contemporary Western philosophical discourses with hysterical historical blindness to this fundamental fact. Her challenge is to point to contemporary philosophy's reductive logic that would gloss and subsume the racial within and as cultural difference and conceive of cultural otherness as a disruption of the Western European way of life. In her words, it is imperative that we, quote, trace how the colonial juridico-economic matrix that sustained merchant capital operates through the racial political symbolic arsenal, which still supports industrial capital as well as financial capital through racial violence. This tracing produces an ethico-juridical assemblage that includes the wars of global capital forcing millions out of their homes to cross the dangerous waters of the Mediterranean Sea and Pacific Ocean, end quote. De Silva insists that, 
quote, images of poetical thought are not linear, transparent, abstract, glassy, and determinate, but fractal, imminent, scalar, plenteous, and undetermined, like most of what exists in the world, end quote. It might be interesting to think about Arthur Jaffa's filmic intervention here as a constellation of the poetical image. But in thinking about Hugh Locke's boats, I recognize two specific images of poetical thought that have been imminent to the lexicon of the slave, the migrant, the, Im the immigrant, and the refugee. The first, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea in this instance, as scalar, plenteous, and undetermined, is the image of poetical thought that constitutes what De Silva refers to as the plenum. For centuries, the sea's history has shaped and defined the perilous journey of slaves, migrants, and refugees from Africa and the Middle East across the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. The second is the boat. I want to consider how thinking with the boat crystallizes the central concerns of our gathering, black precarity, futurity, and fungibility in the global present, and how we can tease out the transnational inflections of these terms through this particular artistic example. I want to couple together Edouard Glissant's observation, quote, we cry our, we cry our cry of poetry, our boats are open, and we sail them for everyone, end quote, with the writer Gayatra Bahadur, who writes, we're all in the same boat. The cliche to express solidarity is nautical. Some questions that retrace the themes of precarity, fungibility, and futurity emerge here. Could the refugee boat be the figure of the open boat Glissant traced, the open boat that sets out in the name of a different humanity, for all humanity? Could the boat, in all its deterritorializing horror, contain the beauty of a new communism? Could the open boat think the world anew? Hugh Locke's boats of various sizes and shapes compel us to consider the overlapping histories that constitute the sea as plenum, where the ship often has a direction and a clear course, the makeshift boat has no recourse or home. A ship is a symbolic object, vessel of the soul, means of escape, both safety and danger. I want to think about, in conclusion, how the overflow of refugee boats holds a certain tension between being simply spectacularized, as in Christina Sharp's words, the mere, quote, containers for all of that unremarked upon history, an asterisk or an ellipsis to move forward the narrative of global capitalist flows. In her words, to look at the boats as more than merely a metaphor for how we look, specifically how we consistently look at these stranded black bodies at, again, using Sharp's words, the maw of capital. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a hype man here. <laughs> Um, so we have uh, some time to um, thank you, Professor Bradley, for that uh, kind exposition of the Hugh Locke uh, piece behind us. Um, thank you, Professor Camp, for bringing us together and for giving us this thinking about the uh, visual frequency of black life. And um, I have some questions, and I'm sure the audience does too. Um, first of all, is Kanye canceled? <laughs> It's Kanye what? Canceled? I hope so. <laughs> Should we take a poll? <laughs> that threw me back, you know? Uh, and um, it made me uh, want to ask a whole bunch of questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to ask both of you. Um, I feel like every question I'm going to ask is a version of what time is it on the clock of the world, right? But what I mean by that is when we gather in a relatively well-heeled refugee camp, such as the one we're here today, right? I've lost count at the number of universities, institutions of higher learning that have sort of organized this space. And we see those really moving images from AJ's film and then the still moving image, right? Uh, to use your, your words, uh, Tina. Um, are we moving forward or backward? Um, 
the refugee boat is, is it coming or going? I know that's a big, <laughs> you know, how do we bring together this sense of sort of stasis, mm -hmm. calm, the need for black feminist study, mm -hmm. and the sort of chaos that's like in all our eyes and hearts, you know, when we think about just the images we just saw. So, I think you started the right, the right question of, is Kanye canceled, right? Because we have to think about how we see or how we hear Kanye now in relationship to when this piece was made in 2016 and what has changed so radically, right? What has changed so radically about Kanye losing his mind, <laughs> right, in relationship to Donald Trump, but also about what is the precarity of black life that a figure like Kanye can represent in both giving us a sort of anthem that can be animated by AJ in the way in which it is, and at the same time, that person that, that figure can flip into the opposite mm -hmm. so quickly, so rapidly, and with such devastating impact. I mean, devastating to so many who have, have ha for whom he means so much, right? For whom his music means so much, right? But again, the other, the other point that you're making about what does that say about what time we are in, right? Um, is another point that I think that Love is the Message um, brings us to grapple with, which is that there is this logic that I see in AJ's work of juxtaposition and, agents, and, and adjacency. So how does this film bring together the past and the present and suggest some relationship to the future? Right? How does the juxtaposition of the profane and the proper, right? The sexual and the sanctified, right? The, you know, the juxtaposition between certain kinds of protests that were working and operative in the civil rights movement, right? That we see all those images of protesters. And then on the other hand, we see images of black folks burning things down, right? because we cannot continue to do this anymore, right? That that is this moment of convergence that I find that we're in, where we have to reckon with the limitations of past struggles and create new possibilities for radical change, right? And that the, the, the frame rate of Love is the Message forces us to really intensely grapple very quickly very quickly and in the frame time, right, of this urgency of, the, of today's moment, right? So I think that's a really important question to ask and it's an important question that I know I keep asking, right, when I, you know, when I'm here in, in Paris, when I'm here in France and thinking about what is the temporality of blackness here, right? Is its temporality, what is that relationship to, um, to co colo coloniality, post-coloniality, and something that Francoise actually um, reminded me of in a conversation where she was saying, you know, there was this moment that was called negritude, right? When blackness was on the agenda, right? When France and its colonies were confronting or confronting, right, the metropole with this thing called black blackness. How is it that we are not still having that conversation, right? And that in various places, that opportunity has receded and now we have to force that back onto the, onto the agenda, right? But what are the terms we're using? And that's where I think that we move to Rizvana's intervention, which is, what is the role of the refugee, the sea, the boat, the overflow, right? The excess. And how is that now opening a space to think about blackness and anti-blackness differently? Yeah, I mean, I actually want to 
go back to your work, Tina, I mean, because I'm constantly in conversation with you and your work, but when I'm reading you writing about AJ's, uh, Arthur Jaffa's film, um, one of the things that I thought was most striking about your description of, of the work is that the, right, um, kind of intense emotionality or the intense emotional surge and I really love this, that we feel when we're watching the film, right, happens not just in the juxtapositions, but in the, in the space between images, right? And finding out about the temporality of blackness, I think, can largely be sensed in the space between images, right? Um, one thing that I'm interested in with respect to thinking about Hugh Locke's work, and you know, it was kind of nice to be able to bring in um, a UK-based artist into this conversation, so that we can also, you know, kind of think transatlantically about this, right? But the, you know, part of what I'm interested in is how the boat is, um, you know. And Tavi, I know you have some questions about what constitutes anti-blackness in the global present, right? Mm -hmm. um, the boat, right, and also the construction of the refugee are two figurations of anti-blackness for me. Um, when we're thinking about the boat and the the, the, refugee, the refugee, right, are two figurations of anti-blackness as they're constructed. Um, when we're thinking about the question you posed, Tina, what is the temporality of blackness, which I think is really critically important, bringing in a thinker like Denise De Silva into this, I think, is crucial because, um, you know, I think this panel is supposed to be, you know, in part thinking about her notion of the poetical. What I like so much about the poetical imagination as she's written about it is that we need to shift from a kind of linear thinking right, to a kind of deep, fractal, uneven thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because right, our, our temporal, affective, emotional geographies are uneven mm -hmm. right, in this you know, current age of global capital. But what's, I think, important to, to, to understand is that, of course, we know, contra the theories of folks like Zizek and Badia, that this is not right, a contemporary crisis, right? That this is a crisis that is folded into, right? Um, a long and ongoing legacy of, of permuting um, global um, coloniality, right? Global colonial modernity. Um, so can I ask a question on that? I was gonna ask you a question. Actually. Oh, I'm <laughs> asking I, the question. I, I know, but I really wanna think about, because Tavia, you know, I do wanna bring your work into this too. And I mean, I know you're somebody who thinks about Afrofutures and black futurity. And so one of the images that appeared in AJ's film is an image of the artist Martine Sims, right? Who's, who's I think, reading from her um, mundane Afrofuturist manifesto. I think mm. that's the title of it. Mm. And mm. so one thing that I think she does in that work, right? And I think we see her in the film saying we are not aliens, right? But one of the things that she does is try to object to or resist the term Afrofuturism, because I think for her it is um, like oh, an overdetermined category for thinking about the sort of more emergent Afrofutures mm. that ha remain unthought. And I think that's kind of what the collective has been trying to do, is, has been trying to think about emergent Afrofutures. And so, you know, this is a kind of like question to you all, but I'm wondering how we can start to think about, you know, um, the different temporalities of these Afrofutures is not, you know, if we disconnect ourselves and untether ourselves from a kind of linear thinking, right? How can we think about futurity and its different, the different potential tenses and subtenses embedded in, right, the future? Is that for me? Anybody, yeah. I have like a couple, I mean, I'm not gonna tackle Afrofuturism, but uh, <laughs> I, I will say, um, you know, uh, maybe in a fractal universe, Kanye is both canceled and not canceled. <laughs> um, we can take fork paths, you know, we're not thinking linearly, you know, and so when we're looking at media and like the sort of black querying of, <laughs> you know, fucking up media, like what we're doing is being able to go in a lot of different directions at once, you know, and so even though in the moment, in the in the now, there is a there's a need to put things on on pause, right? Um, you know, it's like it would be great to have a trigger warning, but like, how can you? You know, like we all have you know we all have very very different. You know, each time I watch that movie, a different thing triggers me. You know, <laughs> like, and so 
Um, you know, is Birth of a Nation canceled? Um, the, um, the mundane Afrofuturist manifesto um, like spoke to me, for sure, yeah. And I don't know, did it speak to you? The, well, we are, not, we are not aliens, we are earthlings. Well, I guess my response to the question that Rizvana posed has to do with two things, is that I'm really, um, I'm interested in the work of artists, of black artists, that make us work. Mm. So I am interested in the kind of effective emotional labor that certain work requires us to do. Mm. And that that is what um, the artists that you're talking about, that I write about, do. And that labor that they make us do is the labor of confronting our discomfort around blackness, right? Hmm. And our discomfort around whiteness. And that that labor is, in this film, you know, it goes from, it travels that entire spectrum from, you know, the beautiful face of Nina Simone, right, to seeing a black man shot in the back, right? And that you have to do the work that will get you from one to the next and back again. And that that kind of work, that kind of emotional labor requires us to be in proximity to the precarity of the communities that we're talking about. And in the moment in which we learn how to sustain that work, to do that work, we are creating a different tense of futurity mm -hmm. because we are creating a different relationship to others. And that that discomfort is crucial to it. Um, and there I also think that the, is that our, he, he set keep a going, timer. Keep going, keep going. He set a timer for our conversation. <laughs> That's why you're a good moderator. <laughs> but, so, okay. You can go backwards in time, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> no, no, you were going. You were no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Wanna... Wanna... Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, you know, I mean, provocative because I think that black, you ask again, I mean, and I'm really interested in you posing the question, what is the temporality of blackness? And when you describe the swinging back and forth, right, um, it makes me think about recursive, the recursive power, right, of the images, like the way that, the way that we kind of have to, I mean, there is no possible linear, right, passageway through the film. Um, and so, I, you know, I just, I think that that's, that's something that I really want to think about. Um, but I also like this, I, I love Love is the Message because of the different sort of affective registers that it forces us to move through. And I think you telling us that, right, we have to work in order to understand this, this particular work. Um, we have to work in order to, you know, keep thinking about what blackness is, right, and its temporality, I think is really, really important. Professor Bradley, could we, could we add, could we ask the artist to add a Hugh Locke image to the film, that work, in your mind? Um, <laughs> well, it's awkward because... Um, like, the boat, like, what's the relationship? I don't want to speak for AJ, but... No, no. <laughs> or Arthur I, Jaffa, but... Okay, um, all right. I mean, I think... I mean, now I'm thinking about where one would place it in the film, but I think it's... Uh, <laughs> just went out, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be an appropriate, you know, registration of the sort of overlapping, you know, global temporalities that we're in, the boat, mm. that is, um, and the way that the boat necessarily indexes a kind of fungible blackness, right, mm. um, in this contemporary moment. I think we should yeah. ask our panelists to join the panel to come on up and to continue the conversation.